Our second scripture today is from the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 25 through 5, verse 2. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing, rather let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you are marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. There were three Baptists who were shipwrecked. And they ended up on a desert island. And one of the first things they did after they had figured out how to plant a garden and to catch enough fish that they could survive was to build the First Baptist Church. They were good Christian people. And so they built this building set aside for worship and prayer and study. And they began their life together. It was some ten years later that they were rescued, and the rescuers were puzzled to find three buildings standing next to each other. The First Baptist Church, the Second Baptist Church, and Calvary Baptist Church. I apologize, you've all heard that joke a thousand times. Wikipedia lists 88 different Baptist groups in North America. There's a caveat, though. It says, this may have changed since we last updated our web page. <laughs> and, of course, that doesn't include the thousands, literally thousands of churches with what I would say is an oxymoron when they call themselves independent Baptist churches. But ever since 1707, when the First Baptist Association was formed in Philadelphia, the first in the United States, Baptists have divided over theological issues. They've divided over political issues. They've divided over moral issues. They've divided over polity questions. They've even divided over personalities. And each time they came to that controversy and someone said, we can no longer be in fellowship with them, for whatever the reason was. Now, we could argue in many of those cases that the specific divisions were proper. Surely there were others that they weren't, but there were some times when we at least would tell ourselves, I would have separated myself from that as well. Think one of the reasons that we are part of the Evergreen Baptist Association based in Seattle instead of the one that's closest to us in, in Los Angeles had to do with theological question. When the changes were all happening here in Southern California, they had a bylaw in the Los Angeles Association that said any church that sends a representative to a, an official representative to one of our gatherings that representative had to have been baptized as an adult. And we said, wait a second. We, we recognize, we, we practice what we call open membership, and if someone was baptized as an infant and says, I own that baptism, we recognize that. And you're telling us we can't send 
Someone in that situation who's a member of our church may indeed be the chair of our deacons, and we can't send them to be our representative. We can't be part of that organization. And so we joined in Seattle instead. We made a choice to separate ourselves out. And as individuals, we make choices about which church, to which church we belong all of the time. Cheryl and I did that. Clergy are in kind of a unique situation because we get to look all over the country, and we did. We looked at churches everywhere. We talked to scores of congregations, and we looked at even more than that on paper. And, of course, as clergy, the church also had the opportunity to look at me and say, oh, no, 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 we don't want you here. <laughs> but we made a choice. And those of us sitting here chose Cambridge Drive Community Church rather than some other place for all kinds of reasons. Might be theological, might be personal, might have to do with a style of worship, it might have friendship questions and historical connection. Maybe it's even that not-so-terrible piece of habit. Sunday morning, I get in my car and it just kind of finds its way to Cambridge Drive. <laughs> but whatever the reason, we've made a choice to live our faith life together. And that is kind of where today's scripture is going. Now, for those who are visiting here today, and, and anybody who sees this on YouTube, I choose my sermon patches, passages in two-month blocks. And I do that from the lectionary, and, and I don't need to talk about why that is, but I'm coming to the end of one of those blocks. So I chose today's passage a little more than two months ago. And, and frankly, I don't know what about it attracted me when I read it. I don't know why I picked this one other, over the other three passages that are in the lections for this day. But this week when I started to, to wrestle with it, Jessica asked me this morning before church, was, was this a hard sermon today? And it was. It was a very difficult one today. And, and one of the first things I do when I get to that week and start to write my sermon is I go in my database to see, did I ever preach on this passage before? Maybe I had a good idea. And, and so I'll pull all of those sermons up and read them. And there are times in that three-year cycle of the lectionary when I choose the same passage every three years. It might be that it speaks to me. It might be that it feels like it fits our congregation, whatever. There are some that kind of percolate to the top like that. Today's wasn't one of them. In 16 years here, I've preached on it one time before. So I pulled the sermon up and I read it. It wasn't very good. <laughs> choose them for a variety of reasons. But the fact that I chose that passage, this passage only once says something about it. My first glance at the passage, it, it almost felt like that trite little saying we've all heard before. Why can't we just all get along? <laughs> and, and then I read it more carefully and saw that's not what it's saying at all. And there's a lot of, of difficult stuff in there that needs to get teased out. Speak the truth. That's controversial in our culture now in and of itself. Get angry, but don't sin. Imitate God. Give of yourself just as Jesus did. This picture that the writer is giving us is that life together in faith is difficult. And it isn't a command just to get along by sweeping all of the difficult stuff under the rug. Because we all know genuine, genuine relationships always have tension. And the closer that relationship is, the more likely we are to have tension. Esther told us that she always likes her brother and she always likes her parents. All of us sitting here smiled. Because <laughs> we know that's not true. And I fully expect that she would answer that because she's a smart little girl. That's what she's supposed to answer. 
But it's just not true. And the closer we are, again, the more tension is possible. And so the writer here to, to, of the Ephesians letter says to his audience, work through those difficulties. Don't ignore them. Let them be there. Let them be genuine and honest and real, but don't let them break you apart. And, and they were real, real issues for the audience. A few weeks ago, uh, I, one of my first sermons has been a number on Ephesians in this, this section of the lectionary. Uh, I talked about the difficulties that the, the audience to this book was facing as they were trying to integrate new Gentile believers with believers who had come from a Jewish background and they had completely different understandings and ways of expecting what God would do in and through them, and, and they literally didn't understand one another. Their backgrounds and expectations were completely foreign to one another. Things that one group took for granted, the other group never even imagined. Never even imagined. And then you take that and you put both of these groups into a new situation that is completely different than either one of them. As this new blessed community is being built by Jesus, was being built by Jesus and is continuing now that he's, that he's gone, and, 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 and taking people who didn't go together and putting them together and breaking down all of the barriers and all of the walls. It was a recipe for struggle. It was a recipe for tension. It was a recipe for difficulties, if they were going to be honest and let those things come out. And the writer is saying to them at this point, embrace the struggle. Live with the difficulties. Work out the disagreements. When your theologies come in conflict, and they did, work it through. When your understanding of morality conflicts, and they did, figure out how to go forward. Where changes need to occur, and where changes in attitude need to occur. Because sometimes your understanding is correct. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes the issue you're talking about really is important, and sometimes it just isn't. Sometimes agreement is required, and sometimes it isn't. Work it through. Forgive one another. Why in the world would you tell people to forgive one another if it wasn't necessary? Somebody felt wronged, and they needed forgiveness. And he doesn't tell them, don't get angry, calm down. He says, no, 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 get angry. Just don't let that anger lead you to sinning against one another. And work it through before the day is over. Work it through. Be tenderhearted, even when the other person is not easy to be tenderhearted with. You know anybody like that? Not me. <laughs> Tell the truth, even when truth is not convenient or it causes difficulties. Because life together, if it's genuine, if it's honest, if it's real, is difficult. But we have to live together as the community of faith. If we really want to be people, follow Jesus. Now, we talk about our time today as being the most divided time in the history of the world. I think that's naive. I think that's naive. Divisions are always there. We experience them in different ways, perhaps, and sometimes, sometimes they're, they're more uncomfortable for us than other times, but they're always there. And I, I just started to run through some of the ones that, that might uh, resonate with us. Some of us here are old enough to have visited the South in the days when if your skin was a little too dark, there were restaurants you couldn't eat in. There were hotels that would not allow you to stay there. There were water fountains you couldn't drink from. There were schools where you were not welcome. 
And if you went in a swimming pool, they drained the pool, cleaned it, and then refilled it. At least one person here that I'm aware of encountered a situation when they bought their property here in liberal California, in, in the promised land of Goleta. And they bought that property there in the deed. Someone sitting here found a deed that said, this property shall not be sold to anyone of African descent. Now, there may be more than one person sitting here. I'm not sure. But there's at least one that I know of. And even still, we don't have to go very far at all to find a gated community with a guard. And you can frame that however you want. The bottom line is, there are some folk, they just don't want to come in. And they aren't going to get in. And then, of course, there's the less controversial way of separating, and that is the price tags that all of us see on living here in beautiful Southern California. Now, that's just a few divisions that we've known. And we could list more and more and more. It's true that some things are worse. We have news silos now and factions in our, in our culture who see the world in entirely different ways. Um, I surf back and forth as I ride in my car between MSNBC, Fox News, CNN, NPR, and the BBC World News. And, and especially when there's something that catches my imagination going on, I'll, I'll purposefully go back and forth between those to see how they're all dealing with the issue. And there are days when I do that, and I'll listen to them, and I wonder if they all live on the same planet. Something that one of those stations thinks is the most important devastating, groundbreaking, amazing, terrible whatever that has ever happened in the history of humanity, and the other station is not even covering it. And then, of course, I get to BBC World News, and they're talking about things that are happening in other places, and none of the other stations even care. Oh yeah, well, Saudi Arabia just blew up a school bus with 41 children on it, and nobody else even mentions it. Well, NPR did, as it went past. But MSNBC, Fox News, and CNN, they didn't touch it. Or at least not while I was listening. If you take two people and they, they each have chosen one of those sources and that's the only one they listen to, it's no wonder they don't understand each other. They don't see the same world. They don't know what the other person sees as problems or as issues, and so they cannot agree. And so that feeds into our polarity. And then Facebook, of course, does it even more. If, like me on Facebook, your feed just feeds everything that you already agree with, there you go. There you go. And the only times I get something different, it's because someone has a Ru Russian bot on their thread. And that is what it is. And so we're more, po more polar in our politics, in our culture, and even in our religion as each of these various silos have their own demographic. And the writer of Ephesians gives us, I think, the same advice. Tell the truth. Be tender-hearted. Get angry, but don't sin. Be people of faith together. But here's an important piece that's underneath everything the writer of Ephesians says. And I think this is critical. 
and, and, I, and I think as, well, various viewpoints aren't equal. Just because someone has a right to their own viewpoint doesn't mean their viewpoint has as much value as someone else's viewpoint. 97% of climate scientists say global warming is caused by human activity and we better address it now or we're going to pay terrible, terrible price for that as a, as a people. Well, the person who has flunked out of junior high biology coming and saying, well, it always gets hot in the summer, and maybe it's because there's too many people with body heat. So it's not anything to worry about. That opinion doesn't have the same value. And even less if they're coming up with that opinion because they have some economic or philosophical reason to deny climate change, or theological one. We've all seen the people that say, oh, well, human beings can't be powerful enough to change the climate. Only God can do that. Well, all I can say is that 97% of oncologists told me that I have a condition, and if I don't address it, it's going to kill me. And one quack, three quacks told me, ah, I'm not so sure about that. I know which ones I'm going to listen to. And I know that 97 of them have an opinion that's based in their life work and is valid and really worth taking seriously, while the other three maybe not so much. And it's true that some positions simply are more moral. Some are closer to what Jesus would do. When one of my acquaintances put a thing up on Facebook that said, basically, we don't need to worry about the children who are being separated from their families at the border, that was an immoral statement. He can believe it if he wants, but it's immoral. There is no question. I'll tell him. I did. <laughs> and it's also true that very, very rarely are any of our opinions 100% correct. There's always room for disagreement, and there's always room for discussion, but that doesn't mean that two diametrically opposed positions are equally valid. The Southern Baptists in the mid-19th century thought they saw justification for slavery in the Bible. They were wrong. It's that simple. They were wrong. Their religion was wrong. Their politics were wrong. Their economics were immoral. It's that simple. They needed to hear that. Unfortunately, the Southern Baptists and the Southern Presbyterians and lots of other Southern people who called themselves Christians split away from those who were trying to tell them truth rather than hear that truth, and we all know how that ended up. I have a hero who chose a different path at that same time. John Woolman. John Woolman was a Quaker who lived in New Jersey. And, and Woolman felt, in good Quaker fashion, the Spirit come upon him and tell him, John, you need to go south. And you need to convince your Quaker brothers and sisters who are slave owners that what they're doing is wrong. Woolman got on his horse and rode south. And he went through the southeast, going from Quaker house to Quaker house to Quaker house, and any place where he found someone who owned slaves, he parked himself. And he talked with them. And he prayed with them. And he prayed for them, and he argued with them, and he did not leave until he had convinced them that owning slaves was sinful. And when they finally would agree, yep, you're right, John, it's a sin that I own these slaves, I'm going to set my slaves free, then he got on his horse and he went to the next Quaker slave owner and 
did the same thing. The story goes that woman visited every Quaker slave owner in the South and convinced every single Quaker slave owner in the South to free their slaves. I'm betting that's an exaggeration. But we know that he did that at least with a very, very significant number of them. And because John Woolman was willing to do what the Spirit called him to do, change has happened. One historian observed that had there been a Baptist equivalent of John Woolman, maybe a couple because there were a lot more Baptists in the South than there were Quakers, we might have averted the Civil War. Woolman committed himself to life together with his Quaker brothers and sisters who were clearly wrong and clearly sinning. But he committed himself to working through that difficult issue. It was an issue with cultural, with political, with religious, and with economic overtones. And those Quaker slave owners who freed their slaves, they suffered from that, but it was the right thing to do. Woman refused to demonize them. He refused to cut himself off from them, but he also refused to compromise with them. And he went, and he called them out for what they were doing that was wrong. And he stood his ground until they saw the truth that he was sharing. I think the writer of Ephesians is calling us today to be like John Woolman. Calling us to see the political, economic, cultural, and religious issues that are surrounding us for what they are. But more than that, the writer of Ephesians would look at John Woolman and say, he, that guy's got it. He did it. And would tell us that you work the hard things through and you stand firmly and solidly for what is right, what is true, what is real. Living together in the community of faith as imitators of God. Let me, I want to close by reading the, the passage again. And I want you to listen to it with all of that in mind. See if you can see John Woolman now. And more important than seeing John Woolman, see if you can see yourself. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors. For we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing, rather let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need so that your words may give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Mm -hmm.